You're listening to the Main Street Finance Podcast, where we take the Wall Street bull by the horns to help you achieve your financial goals. Whether it's budgeting, investing, or financial independence, we tackle the big questions in the pursuit of financial literacy. And now, your host... Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Main Street Finance Podcast. I am, of course, Alex, your host, and this week we have an interview with Barry Spencer. Now, Barry is the co-creator of the wealth planning firm Wealth With No Regrets, which provides advice on retirement and wealth planning, but they also specialize in charitable donations and philanthropy or, you know, how to give away a bunch of money and, you know, not have to pay taxes because of it. He has also either written or contributed to four books on personal finance. We are very happy to have him here today. Barry, welcome to the show. Hey, Alex. Thanks so much. Good to be with you. Oh, well, thank you. I'm just glad you were able to take some time out of your day. I know we're up against a deadline, so let's go ahead and hop right into it. So would you like to go into a little bit more of your history and what Wealth With No Regrets does? Sure. I, you know, the creation of Wealth With No Regrets came as a little bit of a surprise to me. It became a uh, roundabout way to get uh, down this road. I, I was an investor when I was 15 years old. I bought my first mutual fund uh, with a little help from my dad. I found a, a mutual fund I wanted to buy and it required $500 and I didn't have it. So I asked my dad that if I came up with 250, would he match my 250 to I, so I could put $500 in this mutual fund. And the next week I come up with my 250, my dad matched it and I was off and running at 15 years old. And I kept doing that over and over again. So I've always been interested personally on the investment side, personally investing over the years, all through high school, all through college and beyond, and had gone down a path of uh, doing leadership training, coaching and development internationally. Uh, And then my dad passed away and my dad passed away at the age of 62. So he was prepared for retirement. He had done his job as a business owner to accumulate wealth, a number of assets, and then to be able to set up uh, my mom for success and also the family from a legacy standpoint, um, and had done his, uh, had done what he thought was best, which was to go hire some advisors, people he knew, trusted, people that had a lot of credentials behind them to help him with his money and with his, uh, his wealth. But when he passed away, I became executor and trustee. And what I found was all the things they had done was really nothing more than have some assets and a portfolio and all of that, but not really a plan. There was no plan in place. There's no income plan in place, no tax plan in place. So as executor and trustee and filing the 706 form, which is the estate tax return form, what I came to realize is there were tax deductions that were missing. There was no income plan set up in place for mom. And the investment structure looked a lot like the investments I started when I was 15 years old and only had $500 and then a thousand, then 2000 and 3000, where by the time my father retired, he had, uh, you know, hundreds of thousands of dollars more than that. So you would think something a little bit more customized, personalized, and obviously something a little more robust in that regard, which wasn't the case. So going through that process, going through that experience and talking to others and realizing a lot of people were missing things along, along the way, Uh, led me into this industry and creating uh, with my partner, who's a CPA, uh, the Wealth With No Regrets planning process to help people really see the opportunities they have to help themselves, their family, and then also causes they care about deeply. Okay. And then, so I have a couple comments there. First off, you came up with $250 in a week at age 15? Yes, sir. I mean, uh, I did a lot of odd jobs when I was a kid. Uh, both at home and not at home. My uh, friend's dad's, my dad was a business owner. A lot of my friend's dads were business owners. So we would just do an odd job wherever we could and scramble together some money I'd save from different uh, birthdays and things like that. And uh, heck yeah. I mean, it was, it was game on anything I could do. Absolutely. Grinding all the way in your teens. I mean, Hey, absolutely. And then your investment philosophy, I would say, is uh, pretty good considering I would assume your investing philosophy at 15 was uh, pretty solid considering your dad plagiarized you, what, 20, 30 years later? <laughs> well, actually, <laughs> my dad didn't plagiarize me. The advisors uh, did. Ah. And so the, the danger was that the thing that really got me by surprise was why would someone with millions of dollars have a portfolio that looked like a kid who had thousands or hundreds of dollars, right? It didn't make much sense to me. And because the way I invested back then was you couldn't own individual equities. It was too expensive. Mm -hmm. Um, So you got into funds, right? 
it was hard to then move in and out of those funds because of costs and trading costs and all that kind of stuff. And so when my father passed, there was no reason to use those same kind of high cost type of funds and transactions. But that's a lot of the big banks and wealth firms do. They still use those kind of vehicles to invest money for folks uh, because it means more for them in their business. They have more revenue to the big banks and the big Wall Street firms and all of that. And and being a part of the private wealth group of some of these big brokerage firms, it was an easy, uh, it's an easy thing for them to do. But I started to see through that. And that's when I really, I said, this doesn't work. This needs to work better for people that have the money and less, you know, less about, <laughs> less about the firm serving the person and more about the person being served. Absolutely. And then just a point of, I guess, reference for the younger audience members out there. I mean, back when you were doing these investments and way back when, I mean, we're talking, we didn't have free trading back then. We're talking like, oh, you want to buy something, place in a buy order or a sell order, that's going to cost you 25 bucks in commission. That's exactly right. So there were big buy and sell orders. So that's why you couldn't come in and out of them. So you had to really do your research and say, do I believe in this fund over the next three, five, seven years? Because I need to stay in it, number one. And those trading costs did prohibit people from coming in and out the way that people do today. So it makes people, I think another point for people to realize, it makes people a lot more short-term minded in investing, which I think while the low cost is good, the short-term thinking when it comes to investing is probably not all that beneficial. Yeah, I 100% agree with you. I mean, when you get rid of trading fees, what you also get rid of is commitment. Because I mean, if you had to pay $25 to buy 10 shares of Walmart, like if you didn't make your $25 off of that, I mean, you're costing 50 bucks because 25 to buy, 25 to sell, like you had to be committed to that position and you didn't want to sell. But now that there aren't any fees, it's real easy for free. I can go buy 25 shares today, sell the 25 shares five minutes later, then buy some more of, you know, a different stock. Maybe I traded it for Target, you know, whatever. It's very easy today for me to do that and not really be, you know, paying $100 just to make those trades. So I think that's true. And I think the other piece that most people don't think about until later or and they're forced to, which is the tax ramifications of those decisions. So from a trading and investing standpoint, yes, it's cost less to make those trades. But from a tax efficiency standpoint, that short-term thinking it can be very detrimental to what you actually keep. So there's something about the money you have, the money you invest, but also the money you keep after you've done that investing. And so, which is a big part of peace when it comes to preparing for retirement, retirement, or even we do a lot with the, uh, to help the kids who are our clients also begin their investment career and investment uh, experience to understand that just because you have the money, when you go to use it, think, be tax smart about it, which is a couple of things, how and when you buy and sell and then what kind of accounts you put that money in, and then what type of investing you do based on the tax account that you're in as well. Those are big considerations when it comes to investing. And most wealth planning firms, most investment firms, most brokerage firms, they just want you to put money at their institution. They want you to leave it there. They want you to just blindly trust them, put money in those investments and let it alone and keep adding to it. And then they're gonna give you a statement. And then that statement, whether it's gone up or down is going to be their version of a plan. And they're going to say, here's your plan. Here's how your assets are doing. And that's not totally the whole story. No, absolutely not. There's a lot of stuff that can be in those statements of, I mean, a lot of people just see, did the number go up? I had $15,000 in the account last month. Now it's $16,000. Hot diggity. I mean, I had, I did this with my fiance, actually. Uh, she had an account that her dad had left for her as a wedding fund. And they had it professionally managed. She looked at it month to month and it's like, ooh, numbers going up. We're doing good. But once she like shared that with me, I was like, hey, let me show you something fun because, you know, I'm a personal finance guy. I showed her that, okay, here's your statements. You know, I forget exactly the time period, but over this time period, your investments went up 8%. She's like, wow, 8%. That's awesome. You're supposed to be, you expect what? Like 7% per year, right? 8%. That is awesome. And I go, well, Sure, 8% is good, but the problem with personal finance is you can't just say 8% good, thumbs up. Over that same time period, if you would have been invested just in the S&P 500, you would have had a 15% return. So sure, that 7 or 8% looks good, or just looking at your statements, it looks good, but how are they doing in comparison to their benchmarks? So it's a great story. I have a, a client that came in and was with one of the big 
uh, brokerage firms that will remain nameless. And for a number of years, uh, this person kept asking the advisor at that wealth firm, the big brokerage firm, big name that everyone would know, tell me how I'm doing. And this person was very uh, savvy financially, uh, had a financial background, did a lot of financial work over this person's 30 plus year career in finance. So very smart, very savvy. And every time this person met with their advisor, the advisor said, like you were talking about a moment ago, that you're doing great. You're up X amount, which doesn't tell the whole story like you're saying, but even more so in relationship to what? This firm never, ever in years of asking showed that in relationship to anything. And this is, this is it. So they'll say, well, we're trying for this target and this did that. Well, you have to realize this versus that asset and this class, this asset class versus that asset class. And I think, what, what does that mean? <laughs> so there's a relationship for sure to something that helps us. So if you're going to use the S&P 500 as a way to say, how am I doing? then you should be invested similar, similarly to the S&P 500. It would be a representative way to look at investment returns, which would mean large cap type of stocks. The problem with the S&P 500 as a benchmark is that S&P 500 is dominated by about five stocks. Yep. So unless you carry the same weight in your portfolio to those big name mega weighted cap stocks, you're, you're going to deviate in performance from that, typically speaking. So these are, these are things to, it's, it is, right? Return, oh, 8%, I should get seven in relationship to what? But then what's in that benchmark? And then how am I invested relative to that benchmark? And then is my relative weight to that benchmark, am I taking on more or less risk than the S&P 500? So if I, if 26%, it's somewhere in that range, 26%, of the return of the S&P 500 comes from like five or six companies. So think about that. 500 companies are in that index. Yet about five or six stocks make up over 25% of the return. I mean, it's literally the 1%. <laughs> so that's where you go and you say, okay, so do I want to take out that kind of risk in my portfolio to even have the same weighting that the S&P 500 does to those? Because it's not a diversified it's a weighted, not a diversified index. That said, you're right. It can give some point of reference for how I am doing better than, hey, I'm up 8% and they, whoever they is, right, tells me I should be up seven. I'm doing good. Now that advisor justifies his means, I guess. Yeah. Or at least they hope they justified it and you don't ask any more questions. Right. Just take it for what I say and ask no more. That'd be correct. <laughs> yeah, look how good this number is. I mean, that's that's better, higher than this number. We're good. You're golden. Don't don't that's please great. don't take that money away from me. <laughs> that's so, great. Uh, you actually hit on a topic a little bit earlier that I want to sort of get back to, and that is tax efficiency with investing. Because there is a sort of, as we talked about before, there is the immediate cost of investing, which might be like trading fees, which as we've discussed has kind of gone away. And then there's the less immediate, the once a year you get your 1099 for investing. And it's like, oh, hey, wow, I did a lot of trades and those are a lot of capital gains taxes. So I was wondering with your specialty, what kinds of common mistakes are done with tax efficiency that people kind of get themselves in trouble with? Yeah, sure. So that, that's a big, big question and a big reason why someone needs to hire a professional that doesn't just help with investing, but also helps with taxes. So if the advisor you're using is not a tax specialist along with an investment person, you're going to miss these things because typically it's just throw money into an account, invest it, let it go up. But as you said, let's take three big accounts, for instance, okay? Okay. You can have a tax deferred account, a taxable account, and a tax free account. So, in the first, the tax deferred account is the retirement accounts that most people are told to use. That's your 401k, it's your IRA, 403b, and the like. Okay. So, people think, well, I'm doing great because I put this money in there. I'm not paying money on the, ta on the money I put in there. I'm not paying tax on the money I put in there. And then it grows tax deferred. It's very important. That account is called a tax deferred account. What that means is you're not paying tax up front, but as that account grows over time, when you go to access it, that's when it's going to be taxed. So it's tax deferred to only delay, essentially delay the tax into the future. So 
when that idea came out, that was 40 something years ago. And that idea was defer, defer, defer. And the reason they said that because a lot of people today don't remember or don't know or haven't been around long enough to have experienced what the elder crowd has experienced, where the top tax rate was 90, it was like 94%. So that means on certain dollars, once you hit the top tax rate, think about that. Every dollar, you're keeping six cents and sending 94 cents to Washington. Yeah, that's a no bueno for me. I mean, it's unreal. It's the reason that Ronald Reagan in the, I believe it was in the 50s, I think is when it was, maybe the early 50s, Ronald Reagan made two movies and then stopped because on the third movie, he'd be in the top tax bracket and he'd be only keeping six cents. He goes, well, I'd rather just ride my horse on my ranch. I mean, why work at that point to get- Why would you, right? To get six cents? That's dumb. So when it comes to tax deferral accounts, the question is this for people to ask. When I go to access that money, will I be in a lower tax bracket, the same tax bracket, or a higher tax bracket when I access that money? The conventional wisdom, the conventional commentary is that, of course, you'll be in a lower tax bracket, which I then go to tell people and say this, the government spending that's been happening more Mm -hmm. ever in our history, how does that get paid? More taxes. That's the government's answer. The government's answer is if I need more money, I tax more people. And history has shown World War I, World War II and beyond, the way they financed that spending, whether it was from war or whether it was from our monetary policy that just you know spends too much money, the answer is raise taxes. And then they say, well, but I'm not going to be the rich guy, right? <laughs> well, you don't really. I mean, Right now, all you have to do is be uh, have a household income of $135,000, and you're essentially in that top 10, 15% group, which means they're targeting you. When they say they're not going to tax you know, people that aren't rich, they're talking about the bottom 50% that already don't pay more than 10% in tax anyway. Yeah. So, that, so we talked about that account, so the tax deferral account. Then there's a the taxable account, which is what you brought up. And that's where I've already paid tax on the money. I put it into an investment account. And as the account grows, you're paying tax on the growth in that money. And we call that the capital gains tax. They're short-term and long-term capital gain tax, right? Mm -hmm. So if it's less than a year, then you're paying short-term capital gains, which is ordinary income tax rates. If it's uh, held more than a year, year year in one day or more, you're paying long-term capital gain tax rates. Those two tax rates can be radically different depending on the tax bracket that you're in. So these are things that need to be considered in terms of those tax holdings. So that was the second type of account from a tax perspective. And the third is the tax-free account. The tax-free account, how much tax do you pay in a tax-free account? Probably none. None. (laughs) Tax-free account, when you go to use the tax-free account, you don't pay any tax when you go access your money. So most likely you've already put the money in post-tax but it grows tax deferred, but now it comes out tax-free. So there's only two ways to get uh, tax-free dollars you can use during your lifetime. There's only two vehicles. One is a Roth account, a Roth IRA account. You can get that through work. You can get it outside of work. Roth account. And the the second one is life insurance. And those are the two vehicles you can use and that you can build up to create tax-free money that you can use during your lifetime. Yep. And I do want to clarify that by tax deferred, the first category of accounts that Barry talked about for the audience here, that's your traditional accounts, whether that be a traditional 401k, a traditional IRA, that third bucket could be a Roth 401k or a Roth IRA. So it's a difference of, did you pay your taxes today with the promise of not paying taxes later, or did you not pay taxes today so that you could pay the taxes later? So that's one in three. And then two is you just, you know, go to M1, Schwab, Fidelity, and just open a fund money account or like Robinhood, call it a fund money account. And you're just investing. And then being taxed at your income tax rate. So short-term capital gains, you buy something and you sell it. And that total time you owned the stock, bond, asset, whatever it is, was less than a year. And then you are taxed on that on your current income tax rate. So if you're in the 26% tax bracket, I'm not sure. I know it goes 24. I'm not sure if the next one's 26 or 28. Say it's the say there is a 26% tax bracket if I'm wrong. If you actually goes 10, 12, 22, 24, 32, 35, 37. So that's a big, those are big G. The big jump is from 24 to 32 and beyond. Gotcha. 
I knew I said 26. I was like, oh, I think I got that wrong. So if your W-2 income, your normal income is the 24% tax bracket, your capital gains tax is going to be 24%. Now, if you're in the 10% tax bracket and your capital and your short-term capital gains is 10%, then I mean, you're paying less. But if you're the kind of individual that's making these big trades, you've got big money in these accounts, you're probably closer to the paying 24% on that versus a capital gains or a long-term capital gains tax, which might be 10 or 15, depending on where you are. Yeah, it goes 0, 15, and 20% on those. And then when the when the what people don't think about in the capital gains arena is um, what they call a, a sneak, it's, it's, it's called, we call it the Obama sneaker tax, which is an additional 3.8%. It's a wealth tax. It's you made too much money. You have too many assets. We're going to tax you another 3.8% on top of the 20% capital gain tax rate that you have to pay. Man, I never even heard of that. So it's an extra 3.8 on top of your 20% capital gains. Yep. In certain cases. Yep. You just find a sneaky way to get you. So there's, there are dozens of taxes people don't realize. Most people think income tax, capital gain tax. And that is true. But there's dozens of other taxes that depending on your income level, depending on your asset level, depending on how you're doing your returns, there's other sneaker taxes that, that filter in. As you move into retirement, there's Medicare surcharge taxes and all this. So you actually pay a different rate on Medicare if you have too much money. So this whole idea that, hey, the rich don't pay their fair share, actually the rich, the rich actually can pay two and three, three times a tax in different ways. So uh, yeah, they're coming around and try and get you. Yeah, people people love to get on a soapbox and say tax the rich, the rich aren't paying their share, yada, yada, yada. But when you actually sit down and look at the numbers, those people will probably be surprised. But I could be slightly off on my percentages here because I haven't looked at it in a little bit. But what is it? The bottom 50% of people pay no federal income tax. And then something like the top 10% of income earners in the US pay 80% of all federal income taxes. Yeah, you're about... You're about right. I mean, it give give or take on, in a given year, but that's exactly right. That top ten percent carries nearly eighty percent of the federal income tax burden, and the bottom fifty percent, you know, at most pay ten percent if they do at all. So, yeah, it's not what the media likes to uh, get on a soapbox about. Yeah, it, because it's real easy to point a finger and be like, "Oh, those darn rich people can't believe them <laughs> taking all our good money, to, uh, taking it, taking jobs, uh, yada yada yada." Sit down and look at the statistics. I'm just going to throw that out there for everybody. <laughs> so now that we have our establishment of our three types of accounts, we have the deferred, the we're not doing anything with taxes, you're going to pay all the taxes, and then the tax-free, what are some good optimization strategies? Like I know one of them is like you never want to buy like REITs or high dividend funds and put those in either your taxable or maybe your pre-tax because you're going to get extra taxes on those dividends. So just sort of maybe simple tips are put this in this account, don't put this in this account. Well, let me go with one of the biggest mistakes that we see. And this is on accounts with people that have literally hundreds of thousands and millions of dollars already saved. So they've already done their work. They've accumulated assets all through their 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. They get out there and I see this mistake come all the time. And it's coming from the biggest brokerage firms, finance firms, wealth planning firms. And the reason it happens, I think, I can't speak for someone's intent, but I think one of the reasons I, I see that is because what I'm about to tell you is because it's easier. Yep. And regulation says make it easier. So you've heard, you know, if I'm younger, I should be 100% in equities or 90-10 or 80-20, right? There's that kind of rule of thumb, depending on how many years I have. And that idea of if it's 80-20, 80% in equities of some kind, whether it's stocks, mutual funds, ETFs, or the like. And then the other percentage in some kind of fixed asset or some kind of safer asset, which typically is some kind of version of a bond or bond fund or bond ETF and that kind of thing. That's kind of the general knowledge, general practice in that allocation. So what advisors typically do, brokerage firms, wealth management firms, and the like, is they take and manage it the same across all the accounts. So whether it's a tax deferred account, a taxable account, or a tax-free account, if they've come to the determination through their risk assessment, right, your, under, your ability to manage risk, which is a whole nother topic of conversation, but let's just go with that. So they've come through the risk assessment, and they've determined that you are 
a 60 40 person, which is kind of their standard place. 60% in some form of equities, 40% in some form of fixed assets. And they will take that allocation of 60 40 and they'll do a same across all the different type of buckets, which I beg the question and say, why? And then it's really this all money is not created equal, and all money is not going to be used in the same way or at the same time. Therefore, to just do all of it the same just says, wait a minute, that doesn't make any sense whatsoever. So that's one of the biggest mistakes we see. And it's whether they got 10,000 or literally $10 million. This is the standard advice across the industry that we just despise and feel like it's totally short-sighted and doesn't take into account some of the other aspects of wealth management that serve people well. Right. And so you're saying like, just to be a little bit more, or just to have a little more clarity, say you are a 60-40 person, 60% in equities, 40% in some kind of fixed income. Chances are when it comes to actually living off of that money, you're probably going to pull out the fixed income first. So, or you're going to pull one in front of the other. There's some kind of priority there. So because of that priority, it would behoove you to have the first money you access in this kind of account and the later money in this kind of account. Yeah, that's that's right. So let's take a young person, for instance, that's saving. So we have a lot of clients with kids that are getting their career started, for instance, right? And they're saving for that retirement in the future or for some event in the future or whatever the case is. So you would think, okay, so I have a taxable account. It's money I've already paid tax on. I put it into a taxable account and I'm going to let that grow. Now it gets taxed at capital gain tax rate, but I have to ask my question, The question is this, when am I going to use that money for what? Are you using it for college? Are you using it to buy a car? Is it for a first house, right? Is it for uh, something else? I got got to repair the house. I got to fix up the house. What, What are you going to use it for? And when would you likely need to use it? If you need to get at that money and you're not 59 and a half to get at the retirement accounts, you need to say, okay, I should, I should access, I should manage that money differently Because what people don't realize is from 2000 to 2009, we had what was called the lost investment decade in this country. And literally over that decade, the total, the average return was 1%. So you had 2000, 2001, 2002, there was a massive fall off. Now, if you were in the tech sector, it was 90 something percent. If you were in just the equity market, you were looking at 58 to 63%. Well, it started to come back. Then we had 9-11 and it went down again, right? Then we had the war and it started to come back and the, the uncertainty of that. But then it took several more years for it to actually come back. And in that year, you had what we call a lost decade. Your return was essentially flat. Mm-hmm. So in that case, what you have to realize is how do I weather that storm? And if I'm working, right, I have income to weather that storm. If I'm not working, or if I need something beyond what my work can afford, I need to pay attention to how I invest that money. So that'd be the near-term, short-term money, right? And then as I retire, then I move into, okay, well, I have a a retirement account and I'm going to probably access that first because if I can compound my growth in a tax-free account, I would want that to compound as much and as long as possible and use that money last. So to bring it full circle to your question, If I have 60, 40 and I have $100,000 for a simple math number, I want the larger part of that 60,000 to be in my tax-free account, compounding tax-free, coming out to me tax-free, and the 40% to be in some mix of the other two accounts. Makes sense to me. As a general rule, that's not financial advice. I'm not saying this is what you should do or how you should do it. I'm not saying, but I'm saying that's the idea that you should consider and work with a financial person that can see your situation and help you make that understanding. See, that is wonderful. And there is something I want to kind of throw out here just as a finish here, a little bow on top of the box here. And that is that I've talked to several financial advisors on this show. Longtime listeners will remember a couple of conversations I've had. And the general consensus is that you don't hire an advisor just to manage your investments. You hire an advisor because really the guy you should be hiring is the person that has everything in finance. Can they help you with your taxes? Can they help you with your estate planning? Can they help you with your investments? Can they help you with your different accounts and handling your household stuff? Like there should be this whole range of services they help you with, not just money management. And there's something, Barry, you mentioned at the beginning of the episode is that you started your firm, Wealth With No Regrets, because 
you noticed that your dad's firm just kind of there was there was some gaps there. Sure, there was a financial plan. Sure, there was stuff being handled. But, you know, there were gaps, which is what it is you guys come in and do. So when you have an advisor, it's not just what money should go where, but there should be a whole gambit of services you should be benefiting from. That's exactly right, because your money is everything. It's not just the return. It's not just, you know, how much money is on the balance sheet or how much money is in your portfolio. That's such a narrow view. It doesn't help you understand how you use the money, when you use the money, how much debt to have versus not have and all those things. And then how do you think about your legacy and your future and your taxes? All of those things get put together that make a huge difference in how you make decisions both today, tomorrow, and in the future. And without that bigger picture, without that bigger view, it's going to catch up with you. For my father, it was too late. And so one of the reasons that I'm passionate about this is that I'm trying to help people see into that future before it's too late for them to do something about it. And I got to tell you, one of the final things I ask people is, what is, you know, a mic drop statement that you would like to just leave our audience with? And I mean, without being prompted, I think you just gave it to us. As a previous financial advisor on the show had said, that 1% fee you pay to the advisor is that 1% fee you pay to get the entire range of advice. Your savings on that 1% fee is probably not going to outweigh the cost of a financial mistake you might make because you didn't have a second pair of eyes on it. Yeah, I think it is that fee, whatever that fee is, if it is a financial mistake you avoid, big help, right? Mm -hmm. If it's helping make an asset more productive, then you know how to make it on your own by helping you see something you didn't know was in the financial place, hugely beneficial. If it's tax savings that you didn't know how to access or get at, I can tell you that 1% is non-existent because of the tax benefits you get. But then when you put all of those pieces together, the multiple should be much greater. And there's been actually separate, separate studies between Morningstar, Vanguard, and the like have done independent studies that show that a professional that knows what they're doing, qualified to handle all those pieces, can be worth 3 to 4% more above the fee per year to that person. So my mic drop to folks is to really, to use your words, is don't go it alone. There we go. And with that being said, Barry, if my audience wants to know more about you, more about any of the books you've written, more about Wealth With No Regrets, where can they go to find you? Absolutely. You can go to wealthwithnoregrets.com. You can email me, Barry, B-A-R-R-Y at wealthwithnoregrets.com. And love to hear from you. Reach out. If there's something we can do, a resource we can provide, uh, there's many of them on our website, free resources, copy my book, let me know. All righty. And all of those links will be in the description below. Barry, thank you so much for your time today. We had a great conversation. Thanks, Alex. Thanks for having me on. I really enjoyed it. All righty. Well, you guys have plenty of links in the description below. Be sure to go check that out and really think about your financial picture and if an advisor will fit into that. And, you know, look around. If you're not getting all of the services we mentioned before that an advisor should be doing, maybe shop around, maybe do some research. But you guys have plenty to do. And I will see you all next time. Thank you for listening to the Main Street Finance Podcast. Have a question on today's topics or have suggestions for future episodes? Send an email to mainstfinance at gmail.com. Sharing is caring. So if you learned something new and useful today, make sure you share with friends and family. Don't forget to like and subscribe to be notified of new episodes. For demonstrations and more examples, be sure to check out the YouTube channel. We'll see you next time.